good evening everybody and uh, welcome to today's episode of uh, marvelous medicine we are extremely fortunate to have professor vikramjit basu he is a professor at the materials research center at indian institute of science bangalore he did his undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in metallurgical engineering from the national institute of technology durgapur and the indian institute of science bangalore he went on to do his phd in ceramics from the catholic university leuven belgium at present with the team of clinicians and entrepreneurs he is actively involved in translating his research into implantable biomedical devices for orthopedic and dental restorative applications and he currently leads the center of excellence at the indian institute of science bangalore dr basu has published more than 200 papers and has authored the first indian textbook on musculoskeletal biomaterials he has co-authored two textbooks one on structural ceramics and the other on tribology After having received several young scientist awards he was the first indian to receive the cobel award for young scholars from the american ceramic society in 2008 dr basu was also awarded the shanti swarup bhatnagar prize for science and technology the highest science award in india for the year 2013 in engineering science category and in 2015 he received the national bioscience award thank you once again dr bikram ji for agreeing to join us at very short notice Thank you very much. Yeah. I would also like to thank Professor Arun Umar ji who helped put me in touch with Professor Vikramjit Basu. It all started by my listening to a talk on 3D printing by Dr. Amjad Manier at Coimbatore a few months ago. Amjad is a head of the department for anesthesia and critical care at Vaidehi Super Specialty Hospital Bangalore and a consultant anesthesiologist for the Axon Anesthesia Associates. Amjad did his MBBS and MD in anesthesia from MS Ramaya Medical College Bangalore and his fellowship in regional anesthesia from Singapore. He has helped organize several workshops on regional anesthesia and has been an invited faculty at over 50 national and international conferences including two world congresses. Amjad has published several journal articles and textbook chapters in anesthesia. started dabbling in 3d printing about two and a half years back and holds a patent for a unique aerosol incubating box the covi hood since then he has been drawing and designing non implantable objects and teaching tools which can be used both in the or and the icu welcome amjad and hope to have a very interesting session thank you madam joining him will be dr mahesh kapanayal and i thank suma balan for putting me in touch with him Mahesh is a clinical professor, Department of Pediatric Cardiology, Pediatric CMR Services, in 3D printing, virtual reality, and innovation laboratory at the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Kochi. Dr. Mahesh did his MBBS from Maulana Azad Medical College and his MD from Lady Harding, and his fellowship in Pediatric Cardiology from Amrita Institute. Dr. Mahesh has been using 3D printing for preoperative planning, communication, and teaching for almost a decade. and has founded the point of care medical 3d printing lab at amrita this facility is being used by many surgical specialties and he has also set up a virtual reality lab and is using vr for virtual planning and teaching dr mahesh has over 30 high impact publications and more than 200 national and international faculty lectures he has received several awards for medical innovation which include the fikki healthcare award for innovation in medical technology commendation from icmr and national innovation foundation at festival of innovations 3d printing world award and grand challenges canada grant award for m health innovation thank you mahesh again for readily accepting our invitation at such short notice and putting all of you together to come up with a proper flow for this program thank you ma'am thank you for the opportunity last but not the least uh, uh, dr mangal dave he is a consultant anesthesiologist at gokul hospital rajkot he did his mbbs and md anesthesia from bj medical college ahmedabad uh, do- i came to know dr mangal dave because he designed and uh, has done several modifications for a video laryngoscope called the task scope task standing for the anesthetic society using 3d printing at a very affordable price which is being used by many anesthetists in the periphery and also in major hospitals where they have access to other video laryngoscopes dr dave's special interests are neuroanesthesia and management of difficult airway uh, welcome thank dr mangal dave thank you ma'am over to you amjad
Thank you, Dr. Vidya, once again for that kind introduction and uh, greetings to my fellow moderators and hello to everybody. Uh, this is an unusual topic, uh, 3D printing in medicine. As Dr. Vidya has uh, aptly put it, medicine is indeed marvelous. But for kids like me growing up in the 90s where technology was coming through, technology also is something that uh, we consider quite marvelous. And as a clinician, if we merge these two specialities, uh, we can create something incredible. So today I'm going to be speaking to you about a rather important technology. You may or may not have heard about this uh, in the past years, but definitely this is something to keep in mind as we go forward in our practice in medicine in the future. I have nothing to disclose. Some of the images and product videos that you would see in this talk are sourced from YouTube. When we were studying math, uh, back in the school days, we were taught when we looked at the graphic graph paper to draw two axes, the X axis and the Y axis. Now, what if I told you that there was another axis that existed, which was the Z axis or the Z axis? Now, this is imperative to understanding the three dimensionality of any object as well as 3D printing. To put it in another perspective, if I ask some of you to draw something three-dimensional, you might want to draw a cube. And as good as an artist that you may be, you might put out something like this, which gives you an idea that it is three-dimensional. If you run it through one of these printers that we all have at home, you would get an image that you can say, yes, it is 3D, but it just doesn't seem to have that feel. Now, what if I ran it through this device known as a 3D printer? And this is what it does. And in the end, you would be left with something that gives you much more feel, much more functionality as a cube. So this is what 3D printing can do. You can create real life objects. It is also known as additive manufacturing. All of you may have some sort of a carving at home. This is known as subtractive manufacturing, where you take a block of material and you subtract some material to create a shape. But with 3D printing, as we know it, we add layers, we add material, and we create the desired object. And this object, more or less, is created in layers. As you can see, this close-up of a randomly printed 3D object, you can see these fine layers. These layers in conventionally available printers can be as small as 50 microns in height. So you just keep adding layers of your design and you get a 3D printed object. Now there are many types of 3D printers available. I'll just try to classify them very, very simply for you. The first kind of 3D printer was actually designed in 1981 in Japan. And this is known as the stereolithography or SLA printers. So basically what it involves is using of a material called liquid resin, which is photosensitive. And in these devices, they project either a UV lighting or a laser light into this vat of uh, liquid resin, and this solidifies. Now there is a platform that moves up like an elevator. So layer by layer, every time the UV lighting goes onto this resin, it solidifies. And layer by layer, the platform lifts this object that has been created. The projector projects the lighting in the shape of the desired object. Now, this is quite nice. This is also still available today. You get plenty of manufacturers making these sort of machines. The limitation is usually that the resin that is available is not very versatile. And uh, this may not be the best printer to use for prototyping performance objects. It's great for making, you know, little models and stuff like that, but probably not great for manufacturing some part or component. Another type of printer involves selective laser sintering or SLS systems. This was devised in the USA. And what this involves is instead of using a liquid resin powder, they use the material in the form of a powder. 
and a laser beam shoots onto the powder and layer by layer it melts this powder. The powder can be a plastic, it can be a metal and the, the heat of the laser melts the powder and it forms a solid object. So this is a short video of how this part is created. You can see a laser beam burning the powder here and a small platform comes and brushes in a new layer of this powder and eventually an object like this is formed. This is in metal. Most 3D printing technologies you will hear about today are about plastic but this is something that's done in metal. Now another type of printer is the fused deposition modeling printer and more or less this is the de facto kind of printer that we deal with today. People like me who do a little bit of uh, modeling of parts and uh, you know make little dolls and toys out of printers will use this sort of a printer. So this is slightly different. The material is available in a spool or in a roller in the form of a filament. Now the filament is pushed through uh, a kind of a heating unit which melts this and this comes out through a nozzle. The nozzle tends to move around along with a platform that moves around and the particular shape that you have designed is drawn. Now this is what the commercial printers tend to look like. They are available at different prices, they are different shapes and sizes. But in general this is what it is like. This is the spool that you see. This is the print head or the hot end which melts this filament. This is the heated bed. You can heat it to different temperatures. And this moves all around like you saw in the earlier videos and you can create different sorts of objects. A very important part of 3D printing is the kind of material that you would use. Now there are a lot of materials that you have to deal with. Each of these materials have different properties and depending on your requirement, you can use or select a particular uh, material. Again, the most common material that uh, most startups use is PLA or polylactic acid. This is a very forgiving sort of material. It's very easy to work with. There are certain other materials available. These are all forms of plastic. If you put it very broadly, these are more or less different types of plastics that are available with different properties. Uh, many things come into play when you try to use these materials. The kind of printer you have, whether you have an enclosure, whether your printer can heat up to the particular temperature to melt these filaments. Uh, again, there's a lot of things to choose from, but if you're starting off with 3D printing, uh, PLA would probably be the way to go. There are some other interesting materials that you can uh, find in the 3D printing world. Uh, many composite materials incorporate elements like copper or uh, things like wood or carbon fiber within the plastic. So the resultant print actually looks like this sort of a parent material. So you can see if you look at this image closely of this elephant, it actually looks like wood but this is a 3D printed object. Same going here, this is copper but this is 3D printed. It's a mix of plastic and the copper. So again, depending on what your needs are, you have a vast array of materials that you could choose from. And of course, metal. Uh, metal is very interesting because in medicine, if you are trying to make implants and tools, we want to have uh, uh, very inert substances that can be either implanted into the body or used uh, within the human body. So metal printing is another option, titanium, st stainless steel, these are all available as options for printing. Now when you want to do a 3D print, there's a, there's a kind of a default sequence that you follow. The first thing is to actually have a model to print. You can either source this uh, from either a computer website or you can actually get down to designing a model. The model, once you have uh, sourced it, needs to be sliced and the print material selected and the way you're going to go about printing it has to be selected and subsequently you go through the process of 3D printing. For 
model design there are many softwares available these are mostly free and open source software some are pay software but i think the most popular software that most enthusiasts deal with is fusion 360 if you are unable to draw or you find that this is too challenging for you you can download models from sites like thingiverse these include uh, little medical knickknacks that you can use around in your hospital depending on your needs once you have these models, the model needs to be sliced. This also involves other software like Cura or Slicer. And uh, this readies your print to be transferred onto the actual machine that does the printing. There are many printers available from different brands. Uh, and contrary to what you might think, some of these 3D printers are actually very cheap. The cheapest printers may start off as less as 15 to 20,000 rupees and move up to several lakhs and uh, crores of rupees. So if you're an enthusiast and you want to do some basic stuff, uh, that would be your budget, maybe 15, 20,000 rupees, you can start off with your practice. So this is just a small example of how you can design. This is Fusion 360, and I'm just trying to draw something in 3D to show you. So here I'm creating a small oval structure okay i've specified some dimensions and that's what you see over there now this is still a two-dimensional image it's just a drawing there now i need to convert it into 3d and one of the things that you do when you draw in 3d is to extrude that is you convert a two-dimensional sketch into three-dimensional by just lifting it up like that this process is known as known as extrusion and now you can see that the object is actually somewhat 3d I'm just going to put some text on over there. Once again, I'm writing this text in two dimensions, but I'm going to use extrusion in a moment, and I'm going to make this text three-dimensional. Right, so I've just centered that over there. And once again, we're just going to extrude this text. So I've, I've defined, you've given some dimensions. You have to be very precise here. There's about two mm thickness, and I'm going to make this text project out by about two millimeters. And uh, that's what you have. You have a simple three-dimensional sort of uh, structure going there. And if you want to be a little fancy, you can round the edges, and you you have a small simple structure ready for print. Now, once you have a structure like this ready for print, you can take it into the slicer. This is a slicer program, very popular, known as Cura. And uh, this simulates your three-dimensional print bed. And you can, there's a lot of settings. If this intimidates you, just be assured that there are a lot of default settings. And once you slice it, it gives you an estimate that this uh, structure might take me about two hours. This is a long time, mainly because the kind of material that I use to print this. It also can tell you how much it's going to cost you to make this. this I'm going to use about nine rupees of material to create this sort of a structure. So then you subject this to a 3D print. And uh, two hours later, you get something like this. This is printed with a soft, flexible material called TPU. So just simple ways to do and create objects. So the advantage of these 3D printers are they're actually very cheap, simple, and uh, contrary to what you might think, they're actually very robust. Uh, even if a small part gets spoiled, you can actually open it up and just replace that. It's very cheap to do so. You can rapidly prototype your ideas and you can create quite strong and lightweight parts even with these sort of plastics. The disadvantages are that if you aren't a bit of a computer nerd, uh, this whole technology can be quite complex to understand. The learning curve is quite steep. Uh, the cheaper you machine, a lot of fidgeting that you need to do. The more expensive machines actually calibrate themselves very easily, uh, but sometimes the cost is quite prohibitive. The cheaper machines require a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of uh, work to get going but when they do the quality prints are quite good 
again, to do those good quality prints, you need to set it up quite well. And as I mentioned, the professional grade machines can move into millions of dollars. So coming to its application in medicine. Now there are some, again, very broad topics to deal with. Now I understand that all of you are from different specialties and each of you can actually use 3D printing within your specialty, providing you find a need. So these are some of the broad categories that you could use 3D printing in. Bioprinting of tissues and organoids. I'll get that out of the way shortly. Surgical preparation assisted by the use of 3D printed models. 3D printing of surgical instruments and custom made prosthetics. And as we go on, I'll show you some of the things that uh, I use in my practice or in my day-to-day -day life. The bioprinting part is actually the most glamorous part of uh, 3D printing. And uh, these are 3D printers that are customized to use uh, living inks or living cells that are layered on top of some sort of a bio scaffolding to create organs. Uh, a lot of work has been done by an American surgeon called Anthony Attila on this. This is a bioprinted kidney uh, at some time, they have used uh, 3D printing to create a urinary bladder. But uh, as attractive as this might sound, this sort of actual functional printing for use in humans is actually looking to be quite uh, several years, if not decades away. Uh, it's very glamorous. It's very nice. Maybe 20, 30 years down the line, we'll have custom built kidneys and livers, but not right now. Surgical preparation. Now, this is something that is rampantly in use all over. And Dr. Mahesh will speak to you about this in his talk uh, in the next section. So many of you have seen, can instantly recognize this sort of an image. This is a CT scan. And what we do is we load the DICOM files or the collective files of the CT scan into various software. This one is a free software called Invisalius. And uh, what we can do is we can do a volumetric reconstruction of the scan and this is a scan of a patient's uh, skull and his brain but if you look carefully once you do a reconstruction volumetric reconstruction you can actually use filters and isolate the bone so you can isolate the skull over here and this can be directly exported into a file that can immediately be 3D printed. You can also print out small sections, say if you wanted to print out the mandible, you can isolate the mandible, or if you have a complex fracture that you wanted to you know, align on the outside before getting into the patient, all this can be done. It's very simple, uh, it's very easy, and it's very quick to do. One can do this at home on your own laptop. And it's not, like I said, it's not like this is uh, something out of a fantasy. This is rampantly happening even in our country. This is one paper that showed uh, a surgical correction for a forearm deformity. So what they did was they printed out the deformed bone and then they looked at the kind of angles that they would require to create an osteotomy and correct this deformity. This is another paper that showed a sacral tumor on the pelvis and what they did was they printed out the entire sacrum and the tumor and they looked at the critical structures that were uh, engulfed by the tumor and uh, they used this, this is like a simulation, they used this simulation before they went into the surgery and performed it on the patient. Another interesting part is the custom made prosthetics that can be used uh, when you do 3D printing. There are a lot of biocompatible uh, materials available. Dr. Basu is an expert on this and he might tell us more about this. So some of the common materials that we encounter are titanium, cobalt, ceramics, polyether, ether, ketone. These are all very, uh, you know, very versatile substances that do not degrade. And uh, things like this, spinal cages, discs, these are all things that can be printed and implanted into patients. This was an article from uh, Bangalore where I live, where uh, the neurosurgeons use 3D printing to create a mold 
to create a bone flap uh, out of uh, acrylic for implantation into a patient. This is another uh, sort of cage implant that is used to uh, close craniotomy defects by printing in titanium. The CT scan of the patient is uploaded. You can upload it or send it to the manufacturer. They will design the size and the, the kind of implant that you need. And it is shipped to you and you can just sterilize it and you'll find that it is a perfect fit for the patient. You can also print devices that are uh, used as scaffolding, say in orthopedic surgery for the bone to grow about in. So these are all different uses that you can uh, find for 3D printing. If you are a surgeon and you have this idea of making some sort of a customized instrument, it's very easy to draw this on the computer and just get it prototyped either in plastic or even in metal. And then if you think that everything is perfect, you can go ahead and manufacture these things. So I am an anesthesiologist and uh, for a while I've been trying to find some use of what we can do with 3D printing and anesthesia. And when I first designed this talk, I, I went on the internet and I looked for different articles. And uh, straight up, this is very commonplace in anesthesia. They were actually very surprised to find that anesthesia itself is actually a very slow starter for 3D printing. But there are some applications. So one of them is in the area of difficult airways or deformed airways or traumatized airways where the trachea and either the first or second generation of uh, bronchus are printed out in patients who have difficult airway. And it's, it's used as a kind of simulation to see whether particular tubes, endotracheal tubes will go in or scopes can go in. So this is one application where you can use the software, do a CT scan, extract just the tracheal part and print it out and then mess around with it with your uh, consumables to see if it works for you. So this was another one, I think this came out of Israel where they printed out a couple of years ago, uh, printed out the model of a trachea and the right and the left main bronchus to prepare for an operation. Not necessary, but uh, it's something that can be done. Dr. Mangal Dave has an interesting video laryngoscope that uh, he will talk about in a while. Uh, but this is another paper that showed that uh, the printing of a laryngoscope with the conventionally available plastic is far cheaper than that of a commercially available one. Now, some of these devices, if you're not an anesthesiologist, are really, really expensive. And the simple process of designing uh, something with the random shape of a laryngoscope and fitting it with a camera uh, can actually be remarkably cheap. This was 27 euros to create this, including the camera uh, versus about five and a half thousand euros for a conventionally available one. As for me, I have been using 3D printing in my practice for uh, about two and a half, three years, pretty much when the pandemic started. Uh, it started out a deep interest for me. Uh, when the pandemic started, all of us were trying to find a box like this to do our intubations in. You know that uh, the coronavirus was rampantly affecting anesthesiologists, especially during the intubation process. And uh, we lost many anesthesiologists to this. Uh, I had designed this box and this box had several components like a base uh, clamps and a port that allowed us to actually do fiber optic bronchoscopies as well as intubate patients with fiber optic scopes without aerosol spillage. So this was a versatile box that I had created and many of the parts that were available uh, were, that were used in this box were 3D printed. At the time of the first lockdown in India, nothing was available uh, and we were lucky to source the polycarbonate that was used to make the box. But the rest of the components like the base, the ports that were required, the clips that were required to uh, mount screens were all 3D printed. and uh, of course, when you design something like this, it requires a lot of adjustments. Your first design is never going to work. So 3D printing offered us the opportunity to rapidly prototype these parts 
and this intubation box had a lot of these components. Uh, I was talking about video laryngoscope. So this was a freely available model on Thingiverse that I just downloaded. And for 2000 rupees, you can get a wireless camera and just fit it in and uh, use as a simple uh, video laryngoscope in, uh, in situations where the regular scope may be unavailable. I also use the 3D print to create anatomical teaching models. Uh, one of my passions is regional anesthesia. So it's always good to have some, uh, you know, anatomical models lying around so you can teach your colleagues and your juniors. So this is a thoracic vertebra that has been printed out. This is a sacrum. And uh, you can either get this these models freely available on the internet or you can just use a CT scan of a patient. This works great even if there is some abnormal anatomy to deal with. Uh, you can just print that out and, you know, look at that abnormal anatomy. As I said, I do a bit of teaching with ultrasound also. So uh, instead of dragging the ultrasound machine into your office to teach somebody, you can have a 3D printed ultrasound probe just to teach hand movements or how you're going to put in the needle when you do a real-time intervention. So these are very simple, very easy to make and print. Some of the newer things that I've been designing is an endotracheal tube holder. When you're in the operating room, the ventilator tubing keeps flopping all over and drags on the endotracheal tube. So this is, it's not something, it's not a new concept, but it's certainly a new design. We used to have something known as an L board. We would get a carpenter to make uh, L-shaped wooden piece and we would prop the tubing on that. But with 3D printing, you can make something quite elegant. This is a multi-material print where uh, this is made out of PLA and uh, this is made out of TPU. It's a very flexible, soft and unbreakable material. These are pressure transducer holders. It's possible to incorporate hardware. That is, this is a 10 rupee metal bolt that has been incorporated into a 3D print. It has been strengthened with uh, an epoxy solution and finished. So this is used to hold the pressure transducers up against an IV stand in the theaters. Back to pandemic time, these masks, most of us who have worked in hospitals know about these masks, but the downside was the expiratory port filter was, was not filtered. It was an open filter. So if you had COVID, there was a possibility that you would transmit COVID through this filter. So these were made that time. It was freely available on Thingiverse where uh, you could print out this sort of a cap, put in a piece of uh, conventional mask or a piece of N95 mask inside, and this would serve as an expiratory port filter. If you don't want to do anything in medicine, there is a, it's a fantastic recreational hobby that you could uh, devise. These are some of the things that I print out at home and paint. These models are freely available. These are actually silicon molds. So you can use 3D printing to create molds and pour soft silicon in there and create a whole lot of lifelike fun things uh, that you could spend some time with. So it's not just medicine. Uh, as I was browsing through the internet, uh, I found these uh, rather delicious looking sushi items. So this restaurant in Japan actually prints out your sushi and it looks fantastic. 3D printing has gone into the uh, construction business also. And now there are houses that can be printed with 3D printers, real huge 3D printers. Uh, apologies to the vegetarians, but this is actually 3D printed meat. The meat is actually uh, layered on and printed as a large chunk like a steak. So in summary, this is technology for the future. Uh, Dr. Mahesh will tell you how he has uh, just wonderfully incorporated it in the many years of his usage. Uh, each hospital in the coming years may have its own 3D design and print department to put out customized implants, equipment, simulators. A little gray area is on the regulations by the uh, FDA or in India, the Drug Control General on the legality of using these uh, 3D printed objects within the human body.
I hope you found this talk interesting and uh, I strongly encourage all of you to look this up as a serious hobby. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Amjad. Um, it's very fascinating talk. Um, I mean, thanks for your time. And I can see there is a lot of uh, uh, comments on the chat box and people are really appreciating your lecture. Now we'll move on to the next talk by uh, Dr. Mahesh. And what we'll do, we'll come back to all the Q&A questions from the audience after Dr. Mahesh's talk. Will that does it sound good? Yes, it's fine, Dr. Basu. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just give me a moment. I'm just pulling my uh, presentation onto my screen. Seems to have disappeared. Okay, sorry for that. Um, I'm just pulling uh, this onto the screen. So here you go. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yes, Dr. Mahesh. Okay, so I'll dive straight into my presentation. So many of you might remember this very iconic scene from you know a movie a couple of decades ago where there was a scene where, you know, the face of the villain was being 3D printed out and which Tom Cruise later wears it in a very crucial part of the, uh, of, of the film. At that time, it seemed like something straight out of science fiction, not something that we were going to see anytime soon, right? But this is right here at Amrita in the 3D printing lab, where we are actually printing out the face of uh, the plastic surgeon in my uh, hospital, Dr. Mohit Sharma. And because he was contemplating, you know, creating a, a 3D print of a face in the case of a face donation or, or a face transplant. So this was supposed to be how we would create a face for the donor uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a transplant case. So this is something that we're, we are printing out right within, within the 3D lab in, in the hospital. So what is the moving on? Um, uh, I think somebody's uh, mic is on, request you to uh, mute it. Uh, so I come from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in Cochin, and I'm a, a pediatric cardiologist. So I'm part of the team that takes care of uh, children with heart disease. So um, this is a complex field. And as pediatric cardiologists, we see a huge spectrum of very bizarre and complex anatomies, which are very challenging to identify, to diagnose, to communicate between us. And I'm sure the surgeons in the forum would really understand the challenges that that poses. And understanding and deciphering complex uh, anatomy is fundamental for not just for diagnosis, but also to really plan how you're going to operate this patient and take forward a successful and safe surgery. And as cardiac imagers, we have many tools for looking at the heart and understanding complex heart disease, which is you know, starting off from basic image tools like ECG, X-ray, and echocardiography. We have advanced tools like nuclear imaging, cardiac CT, cardiac MRI, et cetera. And interestingly, much of this medical imaging is actually 3D volumetric imaging, especially you look at CT scans, MRI scans, 3D ultrasounds. They're all made up of stacks of image data, which if you put together, tag them up on top of each other, you can actually understand the three-dimensionality of the imaging data set. And these imaging data sets are all in the DICOM format. But even though they're three-dimensional data, this is how you usually look at imaging data, right? You, you, you lift up a film or, or, you, or you're looking, staring at the two-dimensional uh, screen of a workstation to try to understand uh, uh, medical images. So this is how you are mostly visualizing even three-dimensional data. How do you get out of Zoom? Uh, I'm in Zoom. I don't know how to get out of Zoom. Uh, excuse me. Can you put yourself on mute, please, everyone? So the third dimension uh, is important, especially for us as physicians, because human biology and pathology obviously occurs in three dimensions. It's, it's, even if you may see it as a two-dimensional photograph or an image, it is actually occurring in three dimensions. And operating fields also are three-dimensional. And it requires us to work through precise depths and planes, sometimes in millimeters or even microns, to really get where we want to 
and do what we want to do. And our eyes, each one of them, if you look at them independent, in, individually, they see the world in two dimensions. It's the brain that processes the two images from both of the eyes and helps us understand depth or stereoscopy. So how can the technology that Amjad just, just talked, talked about or, or other similar technologies, how can it help enhance the 3D visualization of medical information or medical imaging data? That's what we're gonna talk about here. And today technology allows us to actually look at medical images in full three-dimensional glory using largely two basic techniques. One is 3D prototyping, like Dr. Amjad said, of creating an actual physical prototype of the biological structure, the organ or the tissue, which you can actually hold in the hand and consider it. And these 3D prototypes would be absolutely one is to one scale. So what you have in your hand would be exactly same in anatomy as what you would find inside the patient's own body. The second way to look at this, the same imaging data set is through something called extended reality. So the extended reality itself has three ways of looking at it. One is called virtual reality. The other is called augmented reality and third is called mixed reality. So we'll speak about this as we go forward. But what we need to understand is that extended reality allows us to actually take these three dimensional um, renderings of medical imaging data and interact with them in true three dimensional space instead of looking at them at a, at a 2D screen, actually experiencing them in full 3D. My own journey to, through this process of adopting and embracing 3D technology started with the story of this young boy. Uh, his name is Hari Krishnan. And he was 17 years old he, when he first came to uh, us at Amrita in the year 2014. And um, he was born with a very complex heart disease. Uh, for the information of the surgeons here, the, pa the patient had a situs inversus, dextrocardia, double outlet right ventricle, a large ventricular septal defect, and pulmonary stenosis. That's a lot of complexities. The complexities were so much that most physicians, doctors, surgeons, wherever he had been to, so even in the leading centers in India, had refused him heart surgery, saying that his surgery was too complex, it would be too morbid, he may not survive the surgery. But the truth was that perhaps we as physician community were failing him because we were failing to perceive the exact accurate details of his anatomy. And that was what was making us hesitant to offer him surgery. So when we did the MRI on him in 2014, we could, we could, we could appreciate the anatomy, we could understand them. But as you see, we are looking at it through two dimensional screens. So as, a, as an imager, as an MRI specialist, when I look at these images, I can somehow make understand that yes, this patient can be operated, but communication is a very big challenge. How do I convince my team members that this anatomy is indeed feasible to be operated? That's the challenge that I faced and I was finding it very difficult to overcome it. And this was a time when for the first time, I decided to use 3D printing to help myself and this patient. Uh, so I used this uh, MRI data set of this patient, collaborated with a company called Materialize, which is based out of Belgium and we created a 3D print of this patient's heart. So now, instead of looking at two-dimensional screens, I took this 3D model of the heart into my surgical meeting, my colleagues, discussing with my colleagues, and now they could actually look inside the heart. They could see exactly where the ventricular septal defect is, how the heart is placed, how the great arteries are aligned, where the ventricular septal plane is. In short, they could exactly, in five minutes, they could figure out something that had not been possible for 17 years and they could make a clear surgical plan and they all agreed unanimously that yes, we can operate this patient. And this patient underwent successful heart surgery. What's also very interesting about this patient is that he had been very sick through his first 17, 18 years, so sick that he couldn't even go to school regularly, but he had a very bright mind and he used, and he used to learn, study technology. And by the time he was in the fifth and sixth standards, he was using the, school, the time that he could not go to school. He was sitting at home and reading up through the internet, learning about technology and the electronics. And he had become an electronics wizard. He was building circuit boards. By the time he was in the ninth standard, he'd built an auto, home automation system that could help him take care of himself, not having to get up every time he had to switch on or off a fan. And, and this boy, unknown to me, just three months prior to his own surgery, he while he was in the 11th standard, he had built his own 3D printer. This was a time when he 
was among the very few people at that time in the country who were really interested in this technology and and he had just read about it communicated with people imported little parts of the machine from here and there and assembled together his own 3d printer and he never knew that the same technology was going to come to his own help today hari is a 23 year old dynamic young man he is a final year msc electronic student and he is fully immersed in the technology of 3d printing he is a part of my own 3d printing lab because it was he who inspired me that this was actually possible within our own ambit and within our, within our own environment and hari has traveled with me across the world he's been to the us speaking with me at major uh, forums talking about congenital heart disease what it is like to be a patient of, with chd talking about technology he now holds regular seminars for college students on 3d printing and he has founded his own company called concept 3d innovators and hari story actually inspired me to set up our own 3d printing lab in 2015 16 and bit by bit little by little we have built up built we have slowly built up an ecosystem where we have our own set of 3d printers and today hari is very much an integral part of our our, our growth in the 3d printing lab and he is a part of our growth into extended reality and so many other technological applications so how does this happen so as amjad said uh, everything begins with a set of three dimensional images so our imaging data medical imaging data which is ct mri ultrasound as i said are stacks of volumetric data we bring this dicom data into a into a workstation where we can segment it out into our region of interest and create a virtual 3d file this virtual 3d file is converted into a format that can be printed in a 3d printer as has been described by dr amjad and eventually we get the actual physical prototype in our hands so these are the 3d printers um, chugging away at their work in in our own 3d printing lab at amrita so this is how it is happening so on you see this image where we have the raw image images this is how you normally see the ct data in in orthogonal planes so here we are using the software to actually segment out our region of interest in this case it is a, it's a newborn baby with something called an lps link and we've gone through the process of segmenting out the information and creating a digital 3d file now that this digital 3d file is ready we export it out to a printer and what we eventually get on in our hands is an exact replica one is to one scale of the patient's own anatomy as if we have plugged it straight out of the screen so now this is very diff different from looking at something on the screen because now you can actually touch it hold it feel it look at it from any angle that you want and you understand that this is an exact copy of what it is inside the patient's body so it really makes a huge a difference to your own understanding of the patient's anatomy so this is a, for example a case with a very complex double outlet right ventricle looking at it and understanding it looking at a workstation screen is going to be extremely difficult but here you are you have an exact life size replica of the heart and you can manipulate it in any which way look around understand where these structures are where the aorta is where the pulmonary artery is what it would take to root this ventricular septal defect into the aorta where would the surgical incisions be so when you go into surgery you know exactly what you're going to do in heart surgery this becomes particularly important because heart surgery is done under cardiopulmonary bypass so if you're not well prepared you spend a lot of that time of cardiopulmonary bypass just trying to understand anatomy whereas if you know exactly what you're going to do and what you're going to find you're going to reduce the cardiopulmonary bypass time and thereby reduce bleeding morbidity and all kind of complications and uh, ensure that the patient has a safe and successful surgery so 3d printing allows for an extremely immersive tactile uh, way of you know understanding anatomy and uh, interacting with anatomy you can understand the shape and form of structures so much better than uh, through conventional looking at images and over the years we it has become almost standard practice for us in our unit to use 3d printing whenever we are faced with complex anatomy it's not necessary that every anatomy needs to be 3d printed out but whenever we are faced with complex anatomies which are difficult to understand difficult to to communicate and where surgical planning is of utmost importance we print them out 
And in the process of actually creating these 3D prints, we are also creating a morphology museum of sorts, because you obviously, in today's world, you can't get your hands on different kinds of complex morphological specimens anymore, but you have digital data and digital specimens on every kind of pathology in the world right now, just lying idle on workstation screens. When you bring them out, segment them out and create these 3D models for 3D printing or for extended reality uh, visualization, you're creating by default an amazing morphology museum that can be dug into at any point of time. And down the years, anybody should be able to access these 3D models, print them out or visualize them to understand complexity. It can be an incredible resource. And these 3D models not just, are not just used for um, surgical planning, they can be used by our fellows for learning morphology, for understanding morphology, pretty much like what you would with morphological specimens. And all of you know that it's very difficult to get hold of morphological specimens, but you can have 3D models of literally any pathology on this world. We also use 3D models to, you know, uh, to perform very complex transcatheter procedures in cardiology, like complex dentings, and, you know, patient specific, you know, uh, modifications to device implantations. So you can actually create bespoke solutions. You can create solutions which are highly patient specific, which are meant for that one specific patient's problems. This is a baby who was born with, the, with something called an absent sternum. And uh, the parents were terrified of even holding this baby because you can see the heart throbbing away and the family had been told there are no real good solutions for this. But what we did was we brought this child in, we did a CT scan, we looked at this anatomy, we tried to understand what the anatomy of the, of the, of the rib cage was. And this was an extremely distressed family, obviously, because they were faced with a, a, a child who could die at any moment from trauma to the heart. So we 3D printed out the thoracic cage of this child. And this 3D printed uh, model helped us really understand exactly how the anatomy is, how, what precise length is that bridge, that, that gap that needs to be bridged. And this allowed us to communicate not only between us as physicians as to what should be the surgical plan, but also with the family members. The eventual plan was that we would take a piece of the patient's own seventh rib and create a bridge to create the patient's new sternum. So Dr. Sandeep, our plastic surgeon, he came up with this idea that he would raise the periosteum from the upper ribs, create a vascular bed on which a piece of the seventh rib would be placed. That entire surgical process was simulated multiple times on the 3D model so that when we went in to um, repair this child, there were no confusions. There was no um, you know, thinking on the table. The surgeons just went ahead and executed the plan and we had a fantastic result. This child, this photo is from the first birthday, but the child is now three years old. This is a boy who was brought in to us in 2018 by a team from a Discovery Channel. He was a boy from Jharkhand, 18 year old with a massive tumor on his maxilla, which was now not letting him eat, not letting him breathe. And he was ostracized in society and he was literally just waiting to die. And this is the time when our plastic surgeon said, can we use 3D printing to plan his surgery? Because this was obviously going to be a very difficult, morbid, complicated surgery. And we use technology to its max. We created uh, the 3D visualizations. We created multiple 3D models. We did virtual surgical planning on him, how the resections would look, where would we make the cuts. We completely planned the surgery digitally and using 3D models. And the surgery was successfully executed. A five kg tumor was resected off and his entire maxilla and part of the mandible and the orbit were all recreated. This is Dr. Subramani Iyer, one of the most fantastic plastic surgeons in the country or even the world right now. And uh, this patient had a wonderful outcome and the whole process was actually televised and shown on a series called Body Bizarre on Discovery. So uh, this is a classic example of how technology can impact real lives. And ever since then, or, or even, in fact, even before that, cranium axillofacial surgeons have taken 3D printing on in a very big way. I think the biggest consumers of the 3D printing lab in my own lab, in fact, my, my closest collaborators are the cranium axillofacial surgeons. It is absolutely routine for them to be printing almost every day in planning surgery. They, 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 uh, they print out uh, surgical jigs, cutting guides. We design implants. Sometimes we design the implants and if it's to be printed in titanium, it's the file, just the design file is sent out to a titanium printer. 
and they print out the, uh, the, the implant and send it back to us. And everything happens in a pre-planned fashion, cutting down hours and hours of surgery and over time. These are really complex cranium axillofacial surgeries and resections where using a combination of virtual surgical planning, creating surgical cutting guides and designing implants, you can give fantastic bespoke patient-specific results uh, to patients in extremely complex situations. So it's not just cardiology and cranium axillofacial surgery. Now 3D printing is being used by almost all specialties in my hospital. This is a pelvis with a vehicular accident crushing. The orthopedicians wanted a 3D print to plan the surgery. The neurosurgeon wants it when there is a complex uh, scoliosis and so on and so forth. This is my own auntie who had a, a tumor metastasis from a CA thyroid sitting deep in her pelvic bone, which no surgeon was willing to touch because of perhaps lack of understanding how to approach it. But once I created this 3D model, which was actually a fusion of MRI and CT images, the surgeons could really you know, go ahead and plan on a surgical resection for her. And uh, thankfully, she, she is doing well after that. This is a recent case where we, uh, we uh, created the sternum for a patient whose sternum had been destroyed by cancer. And this is a case where we are, on which we are working right now. There's a sternal deformity, and we are doing the digital planning on how to create a sternal implant. This is still a work in progress. So we have designed a sternal implant, which will eventually get printed out in titanium and will go into the patient's body. So these are all examples of how technology has directly affected human lives. But it's not just patient-specific applications, but like Dr. Dr. Amjad has said, so many other things are possible. During the COVID times, much before these things became available in the market, we were printing out face shields, mask holders, masks, and uh, we created a, 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 a PAPR where the parts were all 3D printed. And every day, uh, somebody from some part of the hospital would come to us with a specific problem, a little adapter, a little switch, a little something that they need, but which is not available, where we design it completely from the scratch on the computer, 3D print it out, and deploy it in the field. So having a 3D printing lab within the hospital creates an ecosystem where everybody becomes an innovator. Everybody who comes up with a bright idea can just walk into the 3D printing lab, discuss, create something, prototype it, test it, and see how it works. A lab has received multiple awards, including a FIKI award for medical for innovation medical technology for innovatively using 3D printing in healthcare. And we got invited to the Rashtrapati Bhavan uh, in 2016 to demonstrate what we were doing with all this technology. Coming down to extended reality. So now what is different about extended reality? The workflow is the same from the imaging you create and segment a 3D model Usually you would 3D print it out, right? To create a physical model. But what if you can just eliminate that last process and instead of physically printing it out, you bring it out into an environment where you can visualize it in three dimensions in virtual reality. So this is what extended reality brings in. So instead of the physical model, you have a virtual model. So how is this achieved? You have seen, you may have seen many of these headsets in the, in the hands of kids who are gamers and a lot of gaming technology is there and you know, kids have been using uh, these kind of headsets and virtual reality for playing very immersive games. It depends upon us as physicians to adapt this technology for our needs. So what we have done in, in, in these last few years using 3D printing, in the process of that, we have created multiple digital models, right? Which were printed out. Now each of them is amenable to be imported into this virtual world, which would allow us to actually interact with it within a completely different way. So here I am putting on a virtual reality headset in the VR lab at my hospital. And here I am pulling in a, a 3D model of heart. Even though you see it on the screen over there, for me wearing the headset, this heart is in three dimensional space suspended in front of me. I can actually walk around it, under it, over it, and I can manipulate it in any which way. I can actually put my head right inside the heart and take a look inside at what is happening. Where is the VST? What are the structures like? What the relationship of these various structures are? It is an extremely immersive and dramatic uh, experience. And, and, and truly, you've got to wear that headset to really understand what I'm talking about. And the beauty is that you can manipulate these virtual uh, models pretty much the same way as you would the physical model. In fact, a physical model can actually break. It may have a shelf life. 
whereas these digital models are perennial. And you can go about dissecting them. You can use cutting planes to go through these uh, models, dissect them in various planes, and manipulate them any which way. This is the beauty of being able to, uh, to view these uh, structures in, in virtual reality. And these are all, and, and, and one can design these models in various parts. And while you're engaging with virtual reality, you can take them part by part apart, try to answer the study questions that are there for that particular case. For example, in this case, the, the questions are all about the surgical steps. Where would we place the incision? Where, what is the relationship of the structures to one another? How would we approach it? So having these digital models in our hand, we can sit in our own space and consider them and really understand them so much better. And this really enables us to plan things in a much, much better way. So this is me and my cardiac surgeon, Dr. Brigitte, sitting in, in the virtual lab. And when Dr. Brigitte is looking at, at a case that he's going to operate the next day. So instead of that conventional looking at the gray and white uh, images in slices on the screen, he is actually engaging with the heart as if it's a real object suspended in front of him. And he's able to get a much deeper perspective into this anatomy. And the more complex the anatomy, the more rewarding it is to be able to actually go through this in, in, in virtual reality. And you can actually slice through it, use dissecting planes to do virtual dissections. And the models being digital are virtually indestructible. So you can go through, dissect them any number of times in any flexible plane, and still it will not be destroyed and it's ready to be seen again by your juniors, by your seniors, or by your students again and again over the coming years. And this allows us to really accomplish the kind of complex surgeries that otherwise might not have been possible. And the best is when we are able to combine virtual reality in some, some places with, with the actual physical models. So the idea is that we as surgeons, when we go into the procedures, we should be best prepared to anticipate the surgical challenges. So using a combination of these techniques sometimes is, is what is the, is the real solution that you are also dealing with it in the virtual space, but if needed, you also have a physical model in hand. So having a point of care lab at our hospital really enables us to really take it across these frontiers. Just an example of something called a topsy-turvy heart, which is one of the most complex and uh, the spatial abnormalities of the heart that's possible. The heart is completely twisted and rotated down, lying deep inside the lower part of the thorax. And it is extremely difficult for an, even a very experienced image to really understand this. But with virtual reality, one is able to interact with it in the three-dimensional space, actually getting inside the thorax and looking at where the heart is lying, how is it rotated. And you are actually even pulling the heart straight out of the thorax turning it around and understanding how low the aorta and the great arteries are arising and how the heart is completely twisted out of the place. This is something that you can never, never truly appreciate looking at the regular raw DICOM images. Today, it is possible to do this whole process of going from DICOM images to 3D models entirely in virtual reality using specialized software. And not just the heart. Here I am looking at, 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 a, at a fracture pelvis in, in, in virtual reality. So, you get that kind of real immersive interaction with the medical images, which otherwise may be pretty much impossible. Here we are looking at a renal tumor and helping the urologist plan a tumor resection where we are actually in a three-dimensional space with that whole medical images and the, the experience is just um, unparalleled and you cannot, you really have to experience it to know. Uh, when we started off this whole uh, unit of this 3D lab was entirely clinician driven, just me, a set of doctors together. We were enthusiastic about technology and we were developing it. But now we realize that that's not enough. So here we are now with, with the first engineer to join our team. Sarin Xavier is an M-Tech uh, and he has joined our team as a full uh, as a, as a full time engineer in our lab. And he solves so many of the engineering problems related to this. So this is how we need to collaborate engineering, medicine, these different disciplines need to come together and different specialities of medicine need to come together to find real solutions. And in the future, you've heard a lot of talk of metaverse. Metaverse is going to be an integrated net network of 3D virtual worlds. And this is going to help us interact with each other with this and similar kind of three-dimensional data. We are gonna have digital morphology museums and libraries. It should be possible for us to share these 3D, live, 3D models between us 
to understand and to learn and to teach in a very immersive way. And this will you know, really truly democratize knowledge, as we say. This is me collaborating with another person based in Toronto, and we are looking at the same model of the heart sitting halfway across the world. So this is going to be so much more easily possible in the future where anybody sitting anywhere should be able to use extended reality applications to understand that. And these technologies are going to really make it easier to share resources and share knowledge. And we are going to discover more and more newer ways to leverage technology. For example, the, the HoloLens by Microsoft is an amazing device which uses mixed reality to, you, you'd actually be able to wear a HoloLens to the, to the operating theater and be able to see the patient's um, three-dimensional anatomy on the patient's own body. And that is where we are heading to next. We want to take virtual reality or mixed reality to the operating rooms to make our procedures even more accurate and safer. So eventually the plan is that, the, the idea is that we should be able to make medicine more personal, more precise, more safe, at the same time, make learning much more fun and immersive. So let's have fun learning, teaching, sharing, and curing. And this has been an incredible journey of innovation and collaboration across disciplines and across specialities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mois, for an excellent talk. And I wish to express uh, sincere thanks or gratitude to both the speakers, Dr. Amjad and Dr. Mahesh. Uh, this uh, talk, uh, this floor is now open for questions. I have seen one question from Dr. Hemant uh, in the chat box. And the question is, as an anesthesiologist, um, I will be very much interested to know how the child was anesthetized or incubated with such large tumor. Dr. Mahesh, would you like to respond? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that question again, sir? Sorry. Yeah, so as an anesthesiologist, this is from Dr. Hemant. No. I will be very much interested to know how the child was anesthetized or incubated with such large tumor. Uh, the boy with the with the facial tumor, the, the the anesthesia team was fully involved. I think that that is a question that would be answered better by our anesthesia team, and um, uh, I, I don't think I am the right person to really answer that. Uh, but yes, it was an extremely difficult case uh, from the intubation to the entire surgical process and the planning. It was a super complicated case. It took about twelve hours, even with all of this. Um, so definitely, it was a very very challenging anesthesia case for sure. Yeah, so if there is any other question from the audience, uh, and then I would like to summarize a few things. Uh, uh, Dr. Basu, you please go ahead with your uh, comments. We, we will wait for the questions in the chat box. Okay, all right. So uh, what I'm going to do actually, um, um, are you able to sh uh, see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, so essentially I'll just spend maybe five to 10 minutes just to summarize uh, the total discussions. Um, so if you see that, uh, I don't know that whether I have uh, captured all the points, but I think that, you know, some of the points are well discussed, particularly the clinical models for pre-operative assessment by clinicians. I think this first point has been very um, well covered by, by our esteemed speakers this evening. Uh, second one, I'm going to show you maybe one example is the 3D printed models are used to manufacture patient specific implants. In, a, in, a, in particular reference to craniopathy surgery, I'll just show you some few examples on that. Uh, we have Dr. Koshi Chatterjee from ISC Bangalore. Uh, so he has, he has started some clinical studies on 3D metal printed bone plates in orthopedic surgery. Uh, maybe I'll invite his comments after some time. Uh, then I'll just show you some examples of 3D printed ceramic implants for dental restorations, drug testing and discovery using 3D bioprinted organs. We have in this audience, Professor Shore, of course, from IIT Delhi. Uh, he may like to comment after some time. 3D bioprinted scaffolds for regenerative medicine. Well, Anthony Atala's example is very well known, but you know, certainly that 3D bioprinted scaffolds are still not used in clinics. So I have put the question mark. This is for, for you know, something for the futures. I have also a few questions for the our clinicians that how many hospitals and clinics have 3D printers in India? 
you know, Amrita Institute certainly is a very good example, but, you know, having so many hospitals and clinics in India, we'd like to see, you know, if somebody has some answers to that. And certainly regulatory issues related to the use of 3D printers or 3D printed parts in clinics, that is also one thing that, you know, uh, we have to address in future. Just to show you what we have done, you know, uh, from three uh, from 2017 onwards, we are, uh, we are we have started this clinical study in two different hospitals. One is Ramay Hospitals in uh, Bangalore, and another is Dattamek Institute of Medical Sciences uh, in Wardha in Maharashtra. So what we use that we take the CT scan image from the patients. For example, this patient has a very large defect after the decompressive craniectomy. Then you use this CT scan data, then we use the 3D slicer and mess mixer uh, analysis of the DICOM files now to reconstruct that cranium model. Then that allows us to define that exact morphology in terms of the size and the shape of the cranium defects. Now, we, on this particular 3D printed model, we cast the polymethyl methacrylate, which is FDA approved material, and then make this uh, bone flap and this bone flap, in, this is the interoperative images. You can see these bone flaps are placed in this particular place uh, in the cranium defect. And you can see the post-operative after two months, the patient's cranium symmetry has been restored with cranial index of symmetry is close to 95%. And you can clearly see in the CT scan data, this is the pre-operative and this is the post-operative that how, um, you know, what is that kind of clinical outcome of this, we have done this kind of analysis in several we this clinical study in 17 patients. So this is in the operation theater that uh, this polymethyl methacrylate bone flap is placed in the patient's cranium after the after let's say we have two months of the decompressive craniectomy, and this is being uh, type, uh, placed very firmly using titanium uh, screws and so on. So this is the pre-operative view and post-operative view of the two different patients, index patients, uh, after their, during their, uh, uh, during the pre-operative and then post-operative surgery at Datta Institute of Medical Sciences in Wardha. So we have done these two clinical studies, as I mentioned before. Now the next few slides, I'll show you that circular single piece implant, there we have done some 3D uh, uh, models of these CAD models of this circular implant, this single piece implant, then we have got it 3D printed in a uh, stereolithography 3D printer in 3D serum in France. And then we are planning to procure the same machine here in Bangalore. And then, so what we do that we, in the single bed, we can make this 90 to 95 of these uh, Gircona implants. And if you see that RA values, surface roughness values of the 3D printed Gircona implants is 0 0.2, 0 0.2 micron. Here, what is the novelty? Novelty in terms of the implant design, like whether we have V threads or buttress threads, or you have a combination of both V and buttress threads at different part along the length of the single piece implant. And then we have done this virtual implantation and loading using FE analysis and then using ANSYS workbench. And we have found out that what is the kind of magnitude of the stresses and strains in the implants. So what is most important as Dr. Mahesh has also mentioned that we have to develop a very mature uh, translational ecosystem in India where innovation ecosystem like where lab scale development, we people do like IITs, ISC and other NITs we have to work very closely with the clinical ecosystems where we can carry out the clinical studies. And at the same time, we have to work with the testing and certification bodies because 3D bioprinting or 3D printing, uh, it has to, if it has to penetrate more into the hospitals and clinics, then we need to have very robust certification uh, process in place. And then certainly we have to work with the manufacturing ecosystem, like where the different companies there, they will have the GMP compliant facilities. So all these key players will essentially, will essentially constitute what I call the translational ecosystem, where government agencies and private sponsors also has a very important role to play to fund this kind of ecosystem. And we have to work very close with the professional societies and national academies. So this is what my vision is in terms of translational ecosystem. You'd be very happy to know in terms of biometers and implants, a number of groups in different parts of India, North India, East India, South India, and Western part of India, they're working um, 
but more, many of their research work is published in very reputed scientific journals. But you know that we have to focus more and more uh, on the translational research to take lab scale research to clinics. With these uh, brief slides, uh, let me go to my summary slides and I stop here for more questions. Thank you. So, um, uh, uh, Koshik, uh, can you please tell us about your work on the clinical studies on the um, bone pets very briefly? Hello, Koshik, are you still there? Uh, I, I don't uh, see the uh, name Kaushik here. So, uh, no. Dr. Mangal, would you like to uh, say something before we go back to the floor? Dr. Mangal, the way. Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Very excellent presentations from Dr. Amjad and Dr. Mahesh. And uh, frankly, yeah, technology, the 3D technology is very challenging. But once you have uh, you have a, a person working for you, it is it becomes very easy. For example, say I started with a task scope in, on a metal metal blade, the curvature of the metal blade I had given, and uh, there was another endotracheal tube which I had fixed over it with araldite. With this, I started it, and I went to the uh, 3D or a person to help me out with uh, with the design so he made me a design and we got uh, modifications in those design and ultimately i uh, we could come i could come up with a, a refined design which uh, we now i can uh, uh, professionally manufacture it i have made a die in which abs material is uh, used and uh, the die uh, is made so this is the ultimate model so, and in fact, uh, this uh, this is a very interesting technology and very useful. And uh, yeah, it is not that technically challenging if you have a proper uh, contact with the person and you can ask him what exactly you want uh, him to do. That that's much, ma'am. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, Dr. Mahesh, I think this talk, uh, this question is to you. Uh, can we send MRI or CT scan study to you to help us in making 3D model and analyzing complex cardiac or thoracic disease? If uh, not possible, send me details of other agencies in North India or near Rajasthan. I Absolute. think distance should not matter, right? <laughs> I mean, Absolutely. I, in fact, I do this all the time for uh, uh, for clinicians from across the country and then sometimes across the globe where complex anatomies are sent to us for our opinion, not just for creating a 3D model, but kind of uh, like understanding better what the anatomy is and what kind of therapeutic uh, options exist. And uh, I'd be happy to help out if uh, one of you wants to reach out. Uh, and usually the process is one um, can upload uh, the raw data. And usually we, we would like to have thin slices of the CT data because when you do the CT scans, when they write it out for the patient on the CD, often the display images are thick slices, maybe four millimeters thick slices. But to get a good 3D print, we need the original raw data where you have thin slice data, millimeter, submillimeter thin slice data. The, 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 the better the slice thickness, the better would be the 3D model so that you, you are able to encompass all the fine structures, the smaller structures, etc. So once you have copied out the thin slice CT raw data from the workstation, you could upload it via uh, um, any of these Google Google, uh, via Google or via WeShare or any of the sharing mechanisms uh, across and uh, would be happy uh, to look at it and uh, opine and, you know, kind of share the 3D uh, uh, renderings with you, which one could even print it out. I think the future is going to be like that because in the future, I foresee that these technologies are going to really help us uh, collaborate widely. There may be one or two centers where, you know, this kind of specialized thing may be done, but the others would be able to, you know, send across the images, um, get back the, the renderings and maybe print it out in, in their own hospital or in their own town. 
And in the future, you know, having something as simple as this, this is an Oculus um, a, a headset, if you can see my camera, this is not very expensive. It comes for about 30,000 rupees. In the future, I, I think that clinicians would be able to wear a simple inexpensive headset in their own offices and be able to interact with these 3D images. That's the way it's going to go. Dr. Mahesh, could you just type out your email ID on the chat box? So sure, we'll do that. So, uh, Dr. Bade said he would like to add something about 3D printers in anesthesia. Uh, can I add? You can? Can, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Hello? Are you yes, able sir. to hear? Yes, sir. The role of 3D printing in pre anesthetic evaluation and simulation. A uh, lot of uh, simulators are coming with the 3D printing, especially the uh, spinal, uh, when you give spinal no, to have a so, uh, simulator which is totally transparent and you can see when you are passing the needle whether it is going upwards or going downwards or whether it is going into the intervertebral disc area. So these simulators are very cheap. They are around uh, 10, 10 or 12 pounds only as compared to the other simulators that we get uh, now from Liardal or any other company. Similarly, it can be used in pre-anesthetic evaluation. When especially when you have got uh, spinal deformities. And for some reason, if you have to really give spinal anesthesia only to this patient. So you can con construct a 3D printing model preoperatively and decide how, where you will put the spinal needle and how will you, uh, which direction you will give and it will help you to give, to insert the spinal needle properly. Similarly, for assessment in patients who are having tracheobronchial anomalies. And uh, <clears throat> those, uh, those uh, 3D printing material which is available for that, that is also very, very useful, especially if you in a pre-anesthetic evaluation, you get CT scan images and have a 3D printing uh, equipment with you. You can utilize it very well for uh, your management in the intraoperative period, or like you are inserting double lumen tube or anything. Yeah, yes, sir. Dr. Mahesh did uh, show us uh, 3D prints of scoliotic spine and uh, uh, 3D print out of the tracheobronchial tree in a patient with uh, uh, tracheobronchial anomalies. Your point is uh, well taken, sir. There is no field where we cannot actually use this. And uh, I'm sure in uh, Amrita also, the anesthesiologists are also very much uh, actively using your uh, help. Uh, isn't it, Dr. Mahesh? Absolutely. And one, absolutely. More, uh, thing, one more thing I just wanted to add. For in, infants with the tracheomalacia, now the 3D printing which is available, it is expandable. So that as the child grows, the, uh, the 3D printing material which you have put also expands. So that uh, it, the growth of the trachea is uh, not affected. Thank okay, you. Okay, I think, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, so Dr. Koshik Chatterjee is there. Koshik, can you please uh, mention very briefly your work on uh, 3D printed metal bone plates? Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, Dr. Koshik. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just tr I'm struggling with the controls here to turn on. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, actually, we've been uh, doing some work with, uh, you know, on titanium implants for uh, titanium-based alloys, actually, for implants for the last few years. And in recently, we've been working with uh, Dr. Satya Vamsi in the Sanjay Gandhi Hospital here in Jayanagar. And he's a uh, upper limb surgeon whose expertise is in... Uh, you know, treating malunions among other things. And recently we started a clinical trial with him. I mean, he's, he's of course leading it. We are providing the support materials and manufacturing side. And the idea is that, uh, you know, we provide him three things. One is the uh, model of the bone, the defective bone, uh, also a surgical guide so that he can make a precise cut uh, for treating the malunion. And lastly, we provide again a 3D printed customized uh, titanium alloy uh, based implant for uh, 
you know the the fracture or 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 holding the pieces of the bones together and uh, we've done it for about 10 patients so far and uh, the plan is to complete this for 30 patients and establish essentially the the efficacy of such an intervention in the clinic so this is an ongoing effort uh, between isc and the sanjay gandhi institute of trauma and orthopedics in bangalore yeah. Thank you, Koshik. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Amjad or Dr. Mahesh, would you like to tell about that? Well, Dr. Sumit Singhal says, I do have my own 3D printer for last 10 years. Cumbersome for me to let me uh, let me know best facility for 3D printer for titanium implants and economic uh, address, contact, etc. So, uh, one of you would like to uh, share your idea, whatever to help them. Mahesh, would you like to get that? Uh, 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 where, where is the question written? Is it on the chat box? Yeah, it's uh, 8.39 p.m. Dr. Sumit Singhal. Just let me get, get to that. Or the the facilities that would print in titanium. So... Uh... Okay, facilities for printing in titanium. Okay, so, so titanium printers are large-scale, almost industrial-scale machines. Um, and it's very difficult to have them inside of a smaller setup or even inside of a hospital there are few centers in india where a titanium is printed because it's it's also because uh, it's usually involves having medical grade titanium titanium is a powder and the printers are these large scale uh, printers which use uh, titanium powder so the whole environment has is very very specific and is almost of an industrial scale so when we also require titanium prints what we do is we design the implants and, and titanium printers run into several crores of rupees uh, to acquire also and uh, everything maintenance material everything is very expensive so I think we need not really individually invest in titanium printers what one can do is whatever one needs made in titanium if we can make the uh, design in titanium and send it out to one of these places one of the vendors which uh, I would be happy to share that with you where we send ours and uh, but the but the design is entirely created by us which is specific to the patient and we send it out to them on an email. It's a simple, small file that can be sent on email. And uh, the printed implant is then received back by us and then is sterilized and it's made ready for patient use. So that's the way we do it. Okay. And uh, for some time to come, unless, you know, titanium printing becomes, you know, much more portable, miniaturized, etc., etc. Until then, this is the way it's going to be with something as uh, highly specialized as titanium. Dr. Sumit, does that answer yeah. your question? Uh, Dr. Vidya? Yes, sir. Hello. Dr. Jit would also be able to, I think, comment on that. Dr. Uh, yeah. yeah, so, um, yeah, I may add there, there are some industrial scale uh, metal printer. For example, I'm aware of one printer based in Bhubaneshwar. So they give this kind of services to some of the clinics in Bhubaneshwar and Eastern part of India, Calcutta and so on. In, um, in Bangalore, we have MS Systems Private Limited, and also Koshik has collaborations with another metal printing company in Bangalore. So we regularly get this stainless steel as well as titanium metal implants uh, fabricated there in a, in a manufacturing technique called SLM, Selected Laser Melting. Um, and there is also another um, company based in US, but they don't have a manufacturing facility here. This is called Formalai. They have a directed energy deposition DED uh, printer. But as has been stated right now, that these machines are fairly costly machines. So it is a few crores in Indian rupees, these machines they cost. But in principle, it is possible to get this titanium printed uh, without much difficulty. Thank you. Dr. Basu, you wanted somebody to comment uh, who was that? Said one more person would be speaking. Uh, oh, Dr. Shodab Ghosh. Uh, I don't know that whether he's still around in the uh, from IIT Delhi. Um, somebody was logged in as Galaxy Note 9. You wanted to say something? Please go ahead and unmute yourself, sir. Uh, yeah, Dr. Vidya, I'm Dr. Tushar Toxic. Uh, excellent talks by Amzad and uh, Dr. Mahesh. 
in just one remark that the 3d technology is one of the prime technology in the metaverse technology so in future i will see that that this 3d technology goes very much uh, ahead in metaverse also thank you so uh, that was dr tushar choksi also an anesthetist and very much interested in the metaverse and uh, <clears throat> So he said he would talk again. So we also have uh, Dr. Shuven Bhattacharji, who's uh, who's also an innovator. Uh, uh, Shuven, would you like to add something? Yeah. Hi, Vidya. Uh, thanks uh, for asking to speak. Yeah, actually, the problem with our uh, specialty is when we're designing something intraocular, which I I do have an invention, a patented invention on my name. Unfortunately, when I tried uh, 3D printing. The dimension was so small, and the, the mechanical strength of whatever material is available right now is not good enough to support uh, uh, the kind of work that I wanted to do. So <clears throat> actually, right now, we've gone to some other technology. But yes, the housing and other things, the active uh, device couldn't be made on 3D printing. The scale was too small. The scale was too small, and would, uh, got very, I, we had very fragile pieces. So I tried uh, various other things. So right now we are doing it on, <clears throat> we are using laser cutting. So we can, but yes, it's it's a technology which I've explored and I do look forward. A very interesting, very interesting talks by all speakers. Enlightening, in fact. Uh, you're an uh, ophthalmologist. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, the ophthalmic uh, instruments and, you know, uh, <laughs> indications are really, really <laughs> small. And yeah, I mean, it is, uh, you could my, probably design the them, is... that, but printing them out is very difficult. And then, Yes. Look, my thing is that handheld instruments, at least we can still print them, you know, because there's there's some amount of mechanical strength. But something which I'm going to use intraocularly, like as a device or an yeah. implant, oh, yeah. it's practically impossible. Right now, absolutely, yes. Until yeah, but I look forward, I look for I've I've noted your mail and I'm I'm looking forward to collaborate with you. Sure, sure. Sometime. Sure. Happy to. Thank you. And I think the crux of this whole 3D printing, the way it will go forward, will be in the hands of uh, uh, people like Dr. Vikram Gage because material science is very, very important in this whole process. And I think everything, the, the future of well, this technology is going to be a lot dependent upon the development of newer and newer materials in which uh, objects can be 3D printed out. That is going to be a very, very important part of this whole process. Dr. Bikram, is there anything in the horizon that could help somebody like you and uh, design small uh, in small implants which can be used intraocular or? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, but I'm um, so 75 I'm, microns. I'm talking 75 microns, 3 mil. Yeah. So essentially, um, we are currently helping one of the Indian startup company um, based in uh, Chennai. So they are developing 3D printer, but there are some issues that we are testing continuously in ISC Bangalore and helping them in customizing. So these people are kind of uh, very good uh, team of engineers who are working in these 3D bioprinters or 3D printers in general. I think there is, I am personally in favor of using indigenous printers, like which are made in India, and then I would like to use it. There are some challenges that we always face, but we have to overcome those challenges. It is not that, you know, if you get the Envision Tech bioprinter for, from Germany, that you can simply plug and use it without any difficulty. They are also, we are facing challenges. So challenges are everywhere, but I'm very hopeful to that, you know, that we can innovate these 3D printers in India, and then we can use it but my one of my question, you remember that from my summary slide, that can somebody tell that, is it like 10% of hospitals and clinics are using 3D printers currently in India? Or no, this by no means. Probably I don't think so. Probably no, 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 no. Not even 1%, not even 1%. Not even 1%. Even 1%. Not even I think Mayesh would, Mayesh would be in the right place. Not even 1%. Less than 1%, I Less think. than 1%, for sure. Less than 1%, right. So. You know that this this is one thing that I would like to um, kind of you know um, recommend more and more these cl clinicians and uh, you know uh, surgeons to use three D printing in different hospitals. So more they become um, more they kind of accept 
and appreciate this kind of technology, I think we'll have a much, much better future in clinics and particularly more what we call personalized medicine, what we call patient specific treatment or patient specific implants. So these, but these horizons will be more and more explored in Indian uh, medicine. And uh, uh, you know, as clinicians, some of you can throw light that um, what is the uh, kind of you know percentage of hospitals or clinics in some of the developed nations like you know Germany or US or France they use 3D printers in those countries. Even in the developed countries, uh, uh, 3D printing is not uh, mainstream yet. In fact, uh, uh, the case that I described to you, uh, Hari Krishnan's case was operated. Incidentally, he was operated by a physician from Stanford, Dr. Mohan Reddy. He's one of the most famous pediatric cardiac surgeons in the world and one of the top surgeons at Stanford. So he comes once a year to America and we keep a bunch of, you know, more difficult cases so that our team does it along with him. So then when Dr. Mohan Reddy uh, came to India in 2015 and he saw Hari's uh, heart print, that was actually the first time that he had actually seen a 3D print of a biological 3D print. And to say that basically even Harvard and Stanford did not have it at that time. So he was so thrilled with it. He said that, you know, this is going to make my surgery so much easier. And in that one session, we used 3D prints for not just Hari's case, another two cases also. And each of those surgeries was super complex, a crisscross heart, an extremely complex DORV. So he was completely thrilled with it. The next year when he came in 2016, they still didn't have a 3D lab. And the moment he landed in India and came to my institution, he said, Mahesh, I want to see the 3D prints of the cases that I'm going to do this year. It was only in 2017 when, you know, he shifted to UCSF that, you know, he drove it because he had experienced what it does. So he told UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, that he needs a 3D printing lab to assist him in his heart surgery. So they actually appointed a cardi cardiologist, Dr. Shafka Tanwar, who is a Bangladeshi origin uh, doctor who, like us, is an enthusiast in 3D printing. So he handpicked him. And so Dr. Shafkat now runs a 3D printing lab. This is just to say that, you know, even leading institutions in the world not necessarily have adopted this technology as of yet. Mayo Clinic is one of the institutions which has been a pioneering center in 3D printing in Rochester. And me and Hari have had the good fortune of actually visiting that um, 3D lab. They've had it since, what, 2002, 2003 and they've been using it extensively. And with extended reality also, handful of centers across the world who really embrace this technology and are developing innovative ways of using it. But I can assure you in the future, all of this is going to be mainstream. It's all going to be like in the workflow of when you, you know, plan therapy and treatment. Dr. Mahesh, uh, uh, there is one question in the chat box. Are any of your surgical colleagues here? Can you please share your experience in surgical training using 3D printing? If we would use it for teaching students, how realistic is the dissection and the, uh, uh, the vascular structures? Yes, I saw that message. Tilaka. So uh, the answer is quite simple. Whatever we can see on a CT scan can actually be uh, rendered into a digital 3D model, either a physical 3D print or a, uh, or a virtual reality or augmented reality model. Now for dissections, dissections, if the surgeon wants to actually go through different, different tissue planes, that is uh, provides another challenge to the kind of 3D printing that we do. Yes, Stratasys, for example, is a leading 3D printer maker company in the world. They have a printer called the digital anatomy printer, which in India costs about two crores. And that one printer has got multiple types of materials and it is able to replicate biological tissue very similar in appearance as well as in tissue characteristics. So there is a bone matrix, there's a soft tissue matrix. So it's a combination of those. So you can design dissectable models in those or very realistic models in those. What we do in our center is we, because we mostly print out pre-surgical models, which are to understand anatomy and to plan, not really to dissect. But the virtual models, we have dissecting tools where you can actually go through in various ways and understand that. But developing a teaching tool is, to, is left to us. We can develop a teaching tool if we have a very specific question. We want to you know, teach dissection of a certain part. 
we can actually create a digital file uh, which can then either be 3D printed out in realistic materials or brought into virtual space where we can go through that process of dissection. The Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, one of the pioneers in 3D printing, they now hold regular cardiac surgery simulation uh, uh, teaching programs where they basically print out the hearts in soft material, which feels like the heart when you cut. So for the heart itself, you know, where you would place the incision, how you would patch it. So it is very much possible. And for it's possible for us also here. You only need to have access to that expensive a printer and that expensive the materials. That's all. But it's very much possible. Um. Uh, Radha Krishna, would you like to say something? We are kind of running over time. Uh, very exciting series of lectures. I think uh, uh, Dr. Amjad uh, made us understand what exactly is 3D printing in the real sense. And I tried to read all these days and couldn't get it. And Dr. Damesh has given such a clinical overview. And of course, some pearls of wisdom by Dr. Bikramjit. This is one of the very good talks in marvelous medicine, I should say. And then, you know, the things that ran through my mind is what when somebody has brought it out that how can 3D printing can be used in teaching? I think it should come a big way in teaching. And second thing uh, that was uh, on my mind is how was that, uh, you know, the bigger governmental institutions, medical institutions didn't take up this when uh, Dr. Mahesh has taken in AIMS and uh, Dr. Amjad has taken in his own uh, stride and so on. And uh, a, a science institution is working on that area where medical institutions are still uh, far behind. And it's nice to know that Jipmer is a, a 3D printer and is doing something about it. I think uh, Dr. Bikramjit should uh, uh, influence the government uh, to you know get into this uh, bigger medical institutions, get uh, you know, high quality printers and... And this should be, I think, uh, advertised or it should be made known to um, a larger medical community. Actually, I think every surgeon who deals with uh, solid structures has a, a, a will have something to you know uh, gain from this. Having said all that, I have one question to the entire uh, faculty: is that you know why is that a day the day is far away where we can have a liver, three D printed functioning liver? functioning pancreas 3D printed. How was, what is the situation in the world now and where are we and when will we reach that place? I think I can try to answer that question. So, um, so 3D printing basically allows us to, you know, replicate anatomy beautifully, precisely. Now it is possible for us to, you know, create a tissue scaffold, say for the liver or the kidney or the heart and put living tissue into it and, and create the structure of the organ. That is possible even today, right now. The problem is in giving it the various functions that they do. The liver has so many metabolic functions, secretory functions. The heart has a contractile function. And, and they have, uh, you know, they have auto, auto regulation at so many levels. They're not just going on one setting. They are responding to various, you know, stimuli from various parts of the body, various systems of the body and appropriately. So the challenge lies there right now. So probably it will require, you know, integration of other biological techniques, including the, the genetic manipulations. And so, you know, in giving that liver tissue, the secretory function, the humoral functions, the contractile functions to the organs, that is the challenge where we are right now. And no doubt science sooner or later will overcome that, but that is precisely where we are now. Some time back, we did not have a way to create a structure also. In fact, a beating human heart, beating heart, 3D printed has already been created. But now how to create that to respond to, you know, your vagal simulation, sympathetic, parasympathetic Liar, systems, banana, banana. all those things, that is going to be the challenge. Once you overcome that, then hopefully we will have a, a day when, you know, you don't need, you know, donors to, you know, donate organs. You could probably take cells from one's own body, you know, convert them into pluripotent cells and take them down the track of one tissue or the other. That would be fantastic, isn't it? So let's hope so. Another thing that you pointed about, about government institutions, I think to be fair, some institutions like Sri Chitra uh, have been you know, trying to use 3D printing. The only problem I think in our medical, this thing is we have very little crosstalk. Sometimes in, even inside the hospital, between departments also, we don't talk. 
you don't know what is happening in anesthesia the what's happening in neurosurgery in plastic surgery people don't cross off and many many times we doctors are you know in our own comfort zones we don't want to go out of that also this kind of a technology for its development and evolution requires us to have a lot of cross talk talk to people like dr bikram ji talk to engineers have an open mind to collaborate cooperate and co create I agree with uh, Dr. Mahesh. There are a lot of inherent issues in printing organs. We would love it, wouldn't we? Just get a kidney printed and get it implanted. But uh, one thing we should realize is that a three D printing process is actually a time consuming process. It just doesn't appear there. And uh, another challenge that they face with the organs is that keeping the printed cells alive while they are building up on the scaffolding. So they're not able to print out. perhaps human size organs right now they're probably able to manage something in uh, rats and rabbits but uh, that is also one of the other challenges that we see uh, again it's something that that's why i said this is something that is decades away it's not something that you would see uh, at least in this decade or probably not in the next but this is something that is decades away uh, for us another point that was raised uh, both by me and dr basu was whether all these implants that we have are regulated uh, i mean it's printed somewhere it's printed on a machine it's titanium we know it works in the body and we put it but sooner or later the government regulations will come into play and uh, there will have to be clarity on this Uh, in the future, I'm sure this is going to get regulated as we go. This will be another challenge for us. Absolutely, the regulatory side, I think, very important in the development of this industry. Also, and as of now, even at the global scale, where it stands, um, bespoke solutions are uh, not strictly under the 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 regulatory side right now. Like, for example, if you're creating something very patient specific for a patient specific anatomy. um even across the world because we've had multiple discussions in international forums on the regulations so it is permissible to uh, go through that um, process of creating a bespoke solution but if you want to create a generic solution a 3d printed generic medical device then it has to go through very strict regulatories and the regulatories in this area are still uh, in the process of evolution and uh, again it will require people like all of us who are interested in the field and who understand value of it to also pitch for what should be part of regulation how it should be regulated etc etc so that the technology continues to make uh, things democratic accessible and so it should not be you know i am i am of the uh, thought of those who believe in the open source systems that you know we should be able to really make things accessible and available to others at a cost effective price uh, dr basu any closing comments yeah so um, thank you very much everybody for your active participation in this um, in this session um, i have one com uh, comment uh, against what uh, dr radhakrishnan mentioned about this engineers and engineering scientists to contribute in this field now i have been working in this field first at iit kanpur and then now at iisc bangalore for over 15 years what i have noticed that you know there is still some bridges to be um, some some there are some existing gaps to be bridged between clinicians community and basic scientist or engineering community for example um, i am currently the president of indian biomedical society biomedical and artificial organ society we always make it a point to invite at least 5 to 6 or at least 25% keynote speakers from the clinician community but to my surprise that you know i am never invited to any of the clinicians conference in india whether it's orthopedic whether it's a dental whether it's a neurosurgeons and you know any other medical fraternity so i think that unless the clinicians also appreciate the work being carried out by us like engineers or biomedical engineers or basic scientists i think this field will grow in india but at a very very slow pace you know if it has to be accelerated then both of us to meet in a common platform interact work together take it forward 
I think that should be our motto, you know, um, and I have an appeal and request just to think very carefully to involve more and more engineers and basic scientists in your conferences so that we also get an opportunity to meet, talk, interact, and start collaboration. Yeah. And uh, frankly, you know that, as I said that in my one of the slides that, you know, that with a lot of sustained efforts, we have been able to create some translational ecosystem. You are very, very welcome to uh, engage yourself or, you know, you can directly write to me. We, I will I'll engage you with our Indian Biometrics and Implant Society as, our, as well as our translational ecosystem. So to take things forward. Uh, can I just uh, add a comment with you? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. So, Dr. Bikramji, the problem is if you see this particular session was widely circulated by Dr. Vidya across a lot of all of social media, and we had a max of I think forty-one participants. Right. Yeah. Right. So you can see the interest. It's a very small focus group right now. So that is where the so the collaboration cross-discipline collaborations will happen, and. Uh, I'm sure if Dr. Mahesh is heading a conference, there will be people, there will be engineers invited. He's already collaborating with engineers. He's got a full-time engineer already with him. He cannot work without engineers. There's, it's, it's impossible. We cannot take it to fruition to that level without collaborating with engineers. So, so medicine has to collaborate. The problem is the, the group or the number of people, let's say, I'm the only ophthalmologist over here. How many uh, different specialties? If you see this practically, only one or two people from each specialty over here. So right. that will be the interest. So unless that interest has generated, that it is going to it is going to happen. Uh, but yes, uh, once people get interest and get a hang of things, it's going to get propelled. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharji. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you, Dr. Vikramji, for you know immediately accepting our. Uh... Uh, I, I was very keen that uh, we should have a non-medical person to, uh, you know, put these things together. And uh, Dr. Basu has also promised to do a follow-up session on this. And uh, so I invite all those who had come today to, uh, we'll have it sometime in September and we'll work out the, you know, details of it. And I'm sure Dr. Mahesh and uh, Amjad and Dr. Bikramjit can decide on uh, what would be, you know, really useful as a follow-up session to this uh, uh, episode. Um, so, okay. We have Dr. Basu's uh, email ID over here. Um, yeah, it is um, Bikram, my first name, B I K R A M. Right. Dot I I S C, Indian Institute of Science. Yeah, I -I -S -C. That's, that's not very difficult. Bikram. Dot I I S C, yeah. Actually, I'm typing in the chat mm -hmm. box. That is my, That will be much faster. Yes. So I sent it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basu. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining and uh, uh, so when it's not just because it's 3d printing everyone has you know there is the uh, uh, webinar fatigue and uh, uh, all these yes. things. So right now uh, people are back to working full time and on a weekday uh, it's it's not that easy so our average attendance for any topic is about 50 now so for that i think we have done very well that you know some niche topic like this has really piqued the interest of many people and uh, everyone who's attended is, you know, completely excited. We have never had this chat box buzzing so much. So thank you everyone for joining. And uh, we meet again next week with uh, another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Uh, till then, uh, take care and stay safe. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good, thank night. You. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.